Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Spiritist Talk series promoted by the United States Spiritist Federation on Saturday mornings at 11 a.m. East Coast time. The U.S. Spiritist Federation is present, committed to presenting Spiritism to everyone. Please support our efforts with a donation at www.spiritist.us US, or by scanning the QR code on screen. As a reminder, the U.S. Spiritist Federation has released a weekly virtual course called Initiation into Spiritism every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. East Coast time. Today, we'll have our special guest, Louise Lima, whose topic is the words of Jesus. And now, let us welcome Louise Lima. Hi, Louise. How are you doing? Hi, Peter. Thank you so much for allowing us to be part of today's uh, Spiritist Talk series. Well, thank you for being here. Before he shares his knowledge with us, let me introduce him more formally. Louise Lima began his journey in Spiritism in 1990. As a serious researcher on the scientific aspect of Spiritism, Louise has been presenting the studies of how to bridge science and Spiritism in both languages, Portuguese and English. Mr. Lima is a renowned lecturer in the Spiritist movement and participates in local and national seminars and events all year round. Louise Lima holds a degree in electronic engineering, and he works in the computer network industry. Thank you for being here, Louise. Yeah. Remember, everyone, to please send in your questions because we will be open for questions after his talk. It's all yours, Louise. Okay, Peter, let, let me take it from here, as we say. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh you guys who are following us right now i'm going to start with a question did you ever hear that the bible has been edited and altered many times over and over again well then we got a sort of a concern here because spiritism is based on the teachings as jesus the uh, teachings of jesus as a reference and these teachings these teachings come from the Bible. They were they are written in the Bible. So if there's all of this concern about you know editing, altering, how can we be absolutely sure that what the extracts from the Bible used by Allan Kardec to uh, explain to us in better words through the book, the Gospel according to Spiritism, how can how can that be trustable? We need to we need to be on solid ground with this thing. We need to be absolutely sure that this is what he said, what Jesus said, this is what he was teaching the people at the time and still today. So we need to look into a little bit into how his words made into our lives, into our days. How was that done? Because it becomes important. So I'm going to start with Jesus walking through uh, uh, the people. He was walking with people in Galilee, in, in different places. So his teachings have two components. First component is his actions, what he was doing. And people were right there seeing. So, so I'm talking about actions, doing hands-on style, doing something. And the other part of his teachings were the spoken words. Those were the speeches, the, the talks, whatever you want to call, uh, sermons. So there's two components here. These two components will establish, and we are going to get into details later, they're going to establish the authority, authority that Jesus had to become who he came to be known by us. We're going to go into details further. Now, all of these things, these two things, the actions and the spoken words, at one point, they are passed along for those who are not with him. So let's say, for example, he was in Jerusalem, but the people, let's say in Jericho, they knew about it. They knew what he had said. So how is that passed along? In, in the first moment, this is passed along through verbal tradition. 
well, we know verbal tradition, right? You hear something, you talk to, you, you pass it along to somebody else who passes along to somebody else and a third per person and a fourth. And the message can be a little bit modified, not necessarily uh, uh, voluntarily, but it can happen. It's something that we know. And then the authority becomes a little bit challenged if that's the case. Now, when we go into verbal tradition, there's going to be a point uh, several decades after his death where we feel the need to write his words to pass it along to the next generations. Because those who are going to be born you know, later on, the future generations, they would not know as it was only based on verbal tradition. It just wouldn't work. So we felt the need to write his words. That's how the Gospels came about. Not only the four Gospels, there's many more, but all of them came because there was a need for that. Now, when we read something, and that's, that's an important component too, if you read the Gospels, they do not carry any emotions. Written words to carry emotions have to be written with that purpose. For example, a professional writer, a, a novelist, they will, b before they say what they're going to say, let's just say that the, uh, a character has to, uh, will say the words, I love you. Before the professional novelist, before he gets to the actual producing the words or printing the words, I love you, there's a tremendous context with nice words uh, describing everything he, he puts you into context and then the i love you might make one sense or another it depends on the context and then as he places the reader into the context we feel those emotions we follow along that's not the case here because the new testament or the bible in general was not written with that purpose so it does not carry the emotions of the moment. It's just words that are describing facts. So the authority and the emotions are the two components here to what is said. And these things, how did they make into our days? One important thing to look at is, this is inside the Roman Empire, which is primarily pagan. So paganism is the dominant uh, a religion. I'm not even going to say religion. I'm going to say practice. And that establishes exactly the main difference between Judaism and paganism. Paganism is based on practice. You have to do certain things. It doesn't matter if you believe in those things. You have to do it. The emperor wants you to do this. You got to do it. It doesn't matter if you believe it's right or wrong. For Judaism, it's the other way around. You only do things that you believe in. So if you believe God wants you to do this and that, you do it. If you don't believe, you don't do it. So there's a tremendous clash of uh, uh, interests here, of views, point of views. So the Jews at times, they were forced to do practices that they didn't believe. And they didn't do anything they didn't believe. So you would create confusion. So in paganism, there's nothing written about those practices. There is no book, it's just word of mouth. You know, um, we need to do this, why, where is it written? It's not written, you just have to do it. So it's, it, it's, it's a non-written, there are verbal procedures per se. In Judaism is exactly the way around. Verbal has less value than the written text. So the original beliefs from the Jewish population they would be valued by those who have knowledge throughout time. There are several prophets and several people who carry that knowledge over and over again to establish the authority. With their authority, the text was written. So those who wrote the texts for the Jews, they carried the authority to do so. And those books, those written texts, became then the authoritative books. And those are the Torah. So you see, for Judaism, something had to, to, to be valuable, something had to be written. And that's exactly the reason why we decide to write what Jesus was saying, to carry on the traditions of Judaism so the next generations could look into a book that brought uh, authority 
and oh, okay, this is what I'm going to do and follow these recommendations, these procedures, whatever they were uh, uh, envisioning at the time. So it, it, the written words of Jesus became fundamental for the people to believe and follow, for those who did so. Now, going a little bit back, verbal tradition. How do we, how does this happen? We got to go back 2,000 years ago. There is no internet. There, re, there are no planes, no cars. So uh, one problem in propagating the message is distance. So Jesus is saying something. He went up the mountain and said something. That was in Jerusalem, for example. How about the guys in Rome? When are they going to uh, uh, get to know about it? So distance is a problem because the message has to be carried by physical traveling. There's no other way, and it takes time. And another thing, another influence of verbal tradition is time itself. For example... If we, uh, Jesus said something, 200 years later, was he still, quote, saying the same thing? Or did we kind of modify and adapt to our needs? So it's time and place have a, a, a component. They are co components that matter into verbal tradition. Another thing that matters is cultural uh, level. Different cultures will read those words or listen to those words and interpret their own way. And it goes throughout times until today. And another problem, language. When he first spoke, we're going to get into translations a little bit, but when he first spoke, he, he spoke in one language. And the language he spoke in is not the language that I'm reading the New Testament on. So there are at least, there is at least one translation in between. How do we see that? Is that translation accurate? Yes or no? We're going to go back to this in a little bit. So that's about verbal tradition. Now, when we decided to start writing his words, a lot of people want them because they want to read. So we had to have copies of the originals uh, throughout the empire, as many as possible. Now, the problem is copying those. There is no printed press. Printed press came in 1455. So until then, everything was uh, uh, scribes just, co just copying. These copies, they happen in, in, in two different ways. First is, let's just say, for example, that you have, go back to 1,000 years ago, okay, that you have one of these texts. And my congregation doesn't. So I'm going to ask you a favor to, you know, I'm going to borrow those from you so I can copy and I'm going to return them to you. But in my congregation, when I get the copy from you, in my congregation, I have to have somebody who can reproduce the text. And only 5% of the population can read and write. So it was hard to find. The people doing this were volunteers. They were not professionals. They were volunteers within each congregation trying to copy those texts. And those texts are not easy to copy. You guys have seen like Greek words and Greek letters. And these texts, they were a sequence of letters without space between words, without punctuation, dots, commas, nothing like this. It was a straight thing. And these people who were not professionals, in, uh, not professional copyists, they had to copy these texts. So, that opens the doors for a lot of mistakes, and there were a lot of mistakes. Now, the other way of copying this is giving the text that you have, a manuscript, to a professional copyist. Pay him to, to get the copy done, and you get your, your copy done. These professional copyists were called scribes. And something interesting comes in place here. Because the scribes, and if you go through the Gospels, you're going to see that at times, several times, the scribes and Jesus, they kind of clash because the scribes don't like what he's saying. They want to have their lives, you know, without any changes, without committing to, to be better, to make any changes. They don't like it just as much as the Pharisees and Sadducees. So they were not really interested in those things. So 
these scribes, when they were copying professionally, they were paid to do this. They, that's how they made their living at the time. They would alter the copies to tailor to their needs a little bit. This is one way of copying. One person gets one manuscript and produces the other one. Still professionals can copy in another way, which is this. Let's say you get 10 professional scribes and they sit in, 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 in a room, each one on his own desk, and somebody goes up front and reads out loud the text and wait for them to copy phrase by phrase. So I can read the first phrase, wait for all 10 copy, and then I read the second phrase. All of them will put the second phrase on paper and so and so. It works. I mean, theoretically, if you think about the concept, yeah, it works. But still, you're subject to mistakes. Just as a side note, this, these places, these rooms where you had a bunch of scribes coughing, uh, they were called scriptorium. That's how the word, similar word, comes in all the Latin languages. Scriptorium, that's the place they were copying these things. So these copies will be distributed and disseminated within the empire. And then I want to show you something here. I want to show you a map, and uh, we can probably bring it up on the screen. Here we go. I want you to look at this map. What you see here is around the Mediterranean Sea, in the middle, all the way around, you see the Roman Empire. And you see four colors, green, blue, red, and brown. And what they mean is on the lower left of your screen, so green is where the gospel of Mark is predominant. Blue is where the gospel of John was predominant. Same for Matthew in brown and same for Luke in red. And we know these gospels are not the same. You see, it, it doesn't mean, this has to be very well understood, people. It doesn't mean that one is right, the other is wrong. Let me give you an example. Let's say I go to four people and I ask them to write a little, let's say 10 pages about one person who has discarnated several years ago. And they will all say, okay, I'll do it. So four different people, okay? And who is the person? Let's just say in our more modern times, Elvis Presley, for example. So the first question is, okay, hold on. Who am I writing this for? Because if I'm writing to people on their 65 plus, that's going to be one approach. If I'm writing to 15-year-olds, that's going to be a completely different approach. And one does not interfere with the other in terms of veracity. They're still talking about the same person. It's just that the angle is different. The Gospels are the same thing because they were being written for different audiences. And the audiences of these evangelists is on the map that you see. So something interesting comes from this. Think about this. The Jesus, quote, please, the Jesus in Rome is not the same Jesus as in Jerusalem. Because the Jesus in Rome is portrayed as uh, according to the gospel of Mark. The Jesus for those living in Jerusalem is portrayed by those uh, reading the Gospel of Matthew, and they are not exactly the same. A lot of the stories are the same, but they are not word for word, they are not point by point the same. So with time, it, 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 the whole thing becomes fragmented. You have different people reading different things about the same person. And the interpretations, the problem is not the written text, is the interpretation of what they are reading. So the people, let's say, in Athens are interpreting all of those differently than the people in Alexandria, for example. So that today, in 2022, it is estimated that we have 41,000 41, denominations of Christianity because we all read the same thing, but we understood in our own way things differently. Shortly, I'm gonna show you another map that illustrates a little bit more, but let's go to the next thing here. So 
Verbal tradition is the first way of getting the message across. Copying is the second. Third, reading. Reading because five, I just mentioned that, 5% or less of the population can read and write. If you can't read, a written text is not going to help you anything. So the only way that this person is going to know all about Jesus and know what the gospel and the good news are is by somebody who is knowledgeable, who can read, read to them. Who are these people? Those are the people in the church and congregations that are more educated, the well-educated ones. But again, they have, they are people. They are just people like you and me. They are humans. They have their preferences. Let's say, for example, that I decide to read the entire gospel according to spiritism to you. When it gets to the chapter, love your enemies, I skip it. So I'm not reading the book as it is. But for you, it's okay because you don't know that. But I'm, you see, there's, there's a problem here. And another problem in reading is a lot of these manuscripts were copied exactly as the original. But the scribes would make personal notes on the side. For example, this, uh, this is a, a, an example, an extreme example, but it did happen. Let's say that I'm copying the part where Jesus says, love your enemies. So I'm described and I'm copying. So I put on paper, love your enemies. And on the side, I make a personal note that says, this is not good. This is not right. It shouldn't be that way. When the person goes to read that, they will read what I wrote as part of the authoritative text. And that's a problem. So reading has its, its problems. And then we go into the next one, which is translation. Well, for people, if you're listening to us and you speak uh, or you have access to more than one language, you know exactly what we are talking about. Translation means interpreting the text to somebody else and telling that text under your cultural level, uh, uh, knowledge of words, knowledge of the vocabulary, and all of that. Knowledge, the history and context. So that's one thing. The other thing is not all languages have the same uh, abilities. For example, in English, the word friend does not tell you if it's male or female. In a lot of other languages, for example, Spanish and Portuguese, uh, the, the word itself tells you if it's a man or a woman. For example, the word amigo is friend, but it's a male. It's clear. You don't have to ask. And the other way, uh, uh, the other one, amiga, it's already written. It's already telling you it's a woman. It's a female. So if I have to translate the following phrase into, for example, Spanish or Portuguese, my friend is here. When I translate, I have to, because of the words available in Spanish and Portuguese, which carry the genre, I have to make a choice. So my reader is going to say, oh, this is a woman. Oh, oh, this is a man. This is not in the original text. This is because of the language limitation, I have to make that choice for you. And depending on the context, this translation can be a disaster. And same way around, uh, same way the other way around. Same thing happens. If you have to translate from Spanish to uh, English, the English version of the original Spanish is, my friend is here. And you're going to ask me, hey, listen, is this a man or a woman? Because the word in English does not carry that. So you see the, how complicated it becomes to translate. I want to show you a next, next map here, which if you look at the map again, Roman Empire, but now it's divided in two parts, two colors. On the uh, left part of your screen, the empire is... Uh, represented 
in red on the east part in dark blue. What this means is the languages that were spoken. You can see on the top right of the screen, green, uh, not green, sorry. Red is where Latin was spoken. Dark blue is where Greek was spoken. The, Testa the New Testament was, we're going to get into this in a second, was originally, let's just assume for now, written in Greek. So, okay, everybody on the eastern part of the empire We'll just read through those who can read, of course. But they will read through and they're okay with that. But the people on the Western part, they, they are complaining because they can't read Greek. They do not speak Greek. Their language is Latin. So I need to translate this Greek text, Greek New Testament, into Latin. And that was done in the year 384 by one of the people in the church called uh, Jerome. So he did that translation into Latin. And again, translations have their own set of problems. One thing that I, uh, I think we need to put our heads to think here, when we do translations like this, on top of the dominating gospels throughout the empire and they were not the same, it puts some, not a layer of complexity to the problem. You see, it's it, it, it kind of, it seems to us that, that it's getting worse as I speak. It is, actually it is, but it's not bad. We're, we're gonna reconcile everything at the end. But I, you need to be sure that you understand what the problems were and where we spiritists stand with this. That's why I'm bringing all of those things. Now, in speaking about translations, last thing, Think about Jesus himself. So the man, the person is there speaking to people around him. There is a almost 100% consensus, almost 100% among historians that the Gospels were written in Greek. And my question to you is, did Jesus speak Greek? to the Jews? I think the easy, uh, the answer is pretty easy. He didn't. He spoke Aramaic, Hebrew, whatever variation. That's the language of the people he was talking to. So even if you were there and you can read and write and you're sitting there at the Sermon of the Mountain, right there, underneath Jesus' mouth. And he said, the first letters, you start writing them. But if you wrote in Greek, that's already your interpretation. That's your interpretation. So even the first gospel, which is going to generate copies and copies and copies and copies with all the problems that we uh, lay down here. The first one, if it was written in Greek, that's already not 100% the words of Jesus. But luckily, luckily, there is something called the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, which is the original written in Hebrew for by somebody, not necessarily Matthew, the apostle. It, it seems like it is. Everything indicates so far, especially in the book, Paul and Stephen, he seems to be him himself under Jesus' mouth, right there, right in the words in Hebrew. When you reconcile the Hebrew gospel of Matthew with the Greek gospel of Matthew, the traditional gospel, they are very, 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 very close. There might be one thing here and there. In the Greek gospel, you will see at times uh, they will write a word in Aramaic. And in parentheses, they will see which in Greek means this, this, and this. So that's a good thing. So th there is a way to reconcile these two things that gives us like a, a, a more uh, easiness to when we read these things. And the last thing about propagating the written message of Jesus is alterations. We spoke briefly about this. Alterations could be involuntary because 
the texts are being copied. It's a massive amount of pages. It's a lot of work. And yeah, mistakes will happen here and there. It would happen to us if you give me a 300 page, eight and a half by 11, handwritten, and you tell me copy this using, again, handwritten, I'm going to make mistakes. So there were involuntary mistakes, but there were intentional mistakes. Intentional mistakes happen because the person copying, the copyist, professionally or not, they thought the theology being taught wasn't what they wanted, wasn't good enough. They, so they omit parts. Uh, they do harmonization of text. Harmonization of text is, is, is something like this. Let's say that I'm a scribe. And instead of getting one manuscript, I was able to get two. So two copies. And I'm going to produce my copy out of those two. So when I get to a certain point, I read the first manuscript and I read the second and they are not the same. Let's just say to make it easy. Uh, the first manuscript says, Jesus went up the mountain to speak. And the second says, Jesus came down the mountain to speak. So when I look at both, I say, oh, my God, what am I going to do here? I got to choose. Instead of choosing one of them, I produce my own version, which is Jesus was at the mount, mountain and he spoke. At the mountain is not from the first manuscript, not the second. So I just created a new one. That's uh, what harmonization does. It's an alteration of the text intentional alteration of the text it might not necessarily be bad intention but it's intentional it was something at the conscious level and there's also personal belief those copying texts they have their personal beliefs and not necessarily you would go with what was written on the text okay so now we as spiritists we stop and think we put our two hands on our heads and say oh my god what am i gonna do now It's not bad, really, it's not bad. When you go to this book here, The Gospel According to Spiritism, and I'm gonna put this on the screen for you, and you read the first paragraph, not in the middle of something, the first paragraph. I'm gonna reproduce the first paragraph on the screen. It is the entire text is just laid out in a way that makes, us, it, makes it easy for us to understand. Here goes. That's how the book starts. This is Alan Kardec, the Gospel according to Spiritism. The subject matter contained in the Gospels, four Gospels, right, may be divided into five parts. One, the ordinary events in the life of Christ. What is that? Narratives. Uh, Jesus went from this city to that city. He came to see this person. He went out of this house. That's it. Number two, the miracles. Number three, the prophecies. Number four, the words that the church used to establish its dogmas. And fifth, the moral teachings. So these are the five contents in the Gospels. And Alan Kardec continues. Although the first four, meaning that excludes moral teachings, although the first four, have been the object of controversy, the last remained unassailable, untouched. The moral teachings are untouched. How can we be sure? Because if you go to the historians, those who are in the uh, criticism, uh, textual criticism business, and they analyze all possibilities and all kinds of things, there's almost 100% agreement that Things were changed here and there, but never the moral teaching, which is the core of his coming. The moral teachings are untouched. So when I read the gospel according to spiritism, can I be so sure that what is here is what is said? Yes, I can. So I read this with confidence. I can read this thing with confidence. I don't have to be, mm, this, I don't think Jesus said this and that. This is what it is. It's and not only uh, uh, cross-checking gospel, number one, 
against gospel number two. There are other texts written by the fathers of the church, by historians at the time, Josephus being one of them. So all of these texts are used to reconcile the differences. And there are a lot of differences, except when it comes to the moral teachings. So how trustable is this? 100%. Be sure, 100%. So we still have the problem with many different interpretations of Christianity. And I want to bring something to you, which is kind of not spoken out loud per se, but it's important, especially for us spiritists. It's something called Christology. What is Christology? Christology is the study of the nature of the Christ. Now, what is the nature of the Christ? Well, in the early days of Christianity, and still today, but in the early days, it was a lot more intense. The, the, I think the situation was a lot more difficult to reconcile than it is today. Anyhow, a lot of people would say, no, he was God himself. He was divine. His nature was 100% divine. Nothing to do with human flesh, nothing like this. Other people said, no, not at all. He was 100% human. He had nothing of divine. Other people would say, no, 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 you are wrong. He had a little bit of each one. He, had a, he was part divine, part human. And then I ask you, how much? 50-50, 60-40, 80-20? 9010. You see the complication for me, right? I want to make it complicated because we need to reconcile this. That's why I'm bringing it this way to you so you can rationally think with me. Okay. So some people would say both, and some people would say it's none of these things. You're all, you guys are all wrong. It's something else. Well, Christology. So what happens in the early days of Christianity is this. You would ask yourself what your personal belief is. Do I believe that this is in the early days of Christianity, okay? Do I believe he was 100% human, 100% divine, or both? If you believed he was 100% human, those were a uh, 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 segment of Christianity called the Ebionites. But if you believed he was 100% divine and the body was like a, a fluidic body or something like that, that would be another fragment of Christianity called docetism. So you would be a docetist, believing that Jesus was 100% divine, his body was something fluidic, they wouldn't know how to explain. That's the other thing. Now, there's a third option here. The third option is, I think he's both. Well, but then we go into another if clause. The first if clause is, is he human or divine? Now, if I think he's both, then there's another if, if clause, which is, how was this essence was his essence straight the same from God, partially from God, just a little bit of God? Depending on your answer, you would create a third segment of Christianity, a fourth, a fifth. And depending on that answer, you would bring up another if clause. So at the end, in the early days of Christianity, uh, what I mean early days is that maybe before the year 100, we had Ebionites, Docetists, uh, we had Arianism, Nestorianism, and it goes on and on and on and on, all because of the interpretation of the nature of Christ. Christology. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to Spiritism. Where is our Christology written? You see, the Catholic Church, they have their Christology. They believe in the Trinity. Trinity. It's written somewhere on the Bible, on the first John. 
same for uh, Islam, same for Jewish, and us too, as spiritists. Where is our Christology written? Hmm. That's interesting, right? Our Christology is written in the book of Genesis, and it's a, it's a chapter, I think, 15, item 2 and 3. This is a part of it. As a man, so we're talking about physical body, okay? He had the bodily composition of corporeal beings. What is that? He had cells, he had liver, he had heart, he had hair. Everything he had in his body, you and I have. Nothing different. The difference is not in the corporeal being, meaning the body. Alain Kardec continues, but as a pure spirit detached from matter, right? Pure spirit detached from matter, he must have lived the spirit life more than the corporeal life the weaknesses of which he would not, have not had. So you see, it appears so far, we're going to go back, uh, uh, we're going to continue the text. It appears so far that the difference between Jesus and us has to do with the spirit. He was a pure spirit. And then Alan Kardec continues. The superiority of Jesus over you and me was not linked to the particularities of his body. We saw that just uh, minutes ago. But to those of the spirit, which dominated matter completely, he did, we don't. And that of his spirit, spirit which was drawn from the most quintessential portion of Earth's fluid and our peri spirit is not. That is the difference. So what is the spiritist Christology? He was human, but he was an extremely advanced, pure spirit, way above what we can ever imagine. This is our Christology. That's the spiritist Christology. And something interesting, then Alan Kardec continues on this chapter 17. And he will say something like this. Let's go by analogy. I think it's a little easier. Let's say when you were a young kid in school, you had a, of course, you had your friends and colleagues and so, and then, you know, school is, uh, is out. You guys are growing. Everyone goes on their own path. So you kind of lose touch with them because they move out of state, out of town, whatever it is. And let's say that 50 years later, 50, 40 years later, one of those colleagues, one of those little guys becomes a very well-known top celebrity. It is not uncommon, and it has to do with the level of morality that we are in, our level of advancement. It's not uncommon for us to see, oh, that guy, that person, that woman, that we used to go to school together. Oh, I, I can tell you all about it. And then you tell everything negative, even what didn't happen. It was this, it was this, and the, and you compare to yourself, because that's what you're going to be using as a reference. So you spit a lot of envy and jealousy. That's not uncommon. We do this. Now, when that person dies, the opinion changes. This is written in Alan Kardec's Genesis, item 2 of chapter 17. It changes because the physical being is no longer there. Only the spiritual being remains. And now you have to deal with the spiritual being's life when we were together as kids and that makes a change that makes that person absolutely more 
valuable than before. You see, that's why, and that's beautifully explained. I, I urge you, we encourage you to read through chapter 17 of Genesis. It is incredible how much more weight the words of Jesus carry today than 2,000 years ago. It's so much so that we put him on the cross because what he was saying was no good. Today, we value his words. We are sorry that he's not here with us telling the same thing. Oh, how I would like to be uh, to meet him, to be heard by him, to hear him, because we put a lot of value in what is said today, but we didn't do it at the time. We put him on the cross. So with, with time, things will change. We will change. We will have a better understand, better knowledge. And the more time it passes, the, the, the longest we are, the, the furthest we are from the days he was with us here on earth, the more valuable his words were. We keep reevaluating this all the time and they become more precious than before. That's very interesting, the way Alan Kardec, with the concourse of the spirits, of course, he portrays that in the books. Very, very, very interesting. And I want to make a last point, which is this. If you remember the map that we showed you before, where we had the distribution of Gospels. Here's the map again. So again, you look at the colors on the lower left, okay, and you look them on the map, and you can see which Gospel was predominant in which region. So Mark had his audience. It was written for the people in these locations that you see in green. John had a different audience. He was written for, he was writing for the people in the blue areas same for matthew in the brown area which is very jew uh, matthew matthew's gospel is very jewish and luke was writing for the people in the red areas so that's fine we understand that i gave you the example of writing about elvis presley so we're gonna yeah it's gonna be different depending on the audience now who was jesus speaking to Mark is speaking to the guys in Rome and Alexander and so. Luke is talking to the is speaking to the guys in Greece and so. Who was Jesus Jesus speaking to? Because he said things that were, to say the least, challenging. Here are some of them. My kingdom is not of this world. And people look at him at the time and say, "What do you mean by that? It's challenging." It's complicated. There are many dwellings in my father's house. They don't even know where the father's house is. What's the address? What's the city? How can I get there? Uh, that's what it is, people, at the time. So he talks about the Beatitudes. People, uh, they struggle to understand. Love your enemies, I think, is a, maybe the top, the number one more, most complicated one. So he said, love your neighbor, be perfect. He said these things. And these things are challenged. Who was he talking to? Who was he addressing the message to? He was not addressing this to Peter, the ship fisherman. He was not addressing this to Matthew, the tax collector. He was addressing this to immortal spirits. He was addressing this to immortal spirits. One of them, who was incarnated at the time, had the name Peter. And he had an occupation, fisherman. He was talking to immortal spirits. One of them at the time had a name. Matthew, and had an occupation, tax collector. 
So what he said to those people that were physically with him, around him, does not take it, does not exclude you and I from his audience. It does not. And this is very, very clear in this book here, Gospel According to Spiritism. I didn't have to be physically there, incarnated at the time, so didn't you. To get to this thing, to understand what it said, internalize and live by it. He was talking to me too. He was talking to you too. He was talking to all of us. So the words of Jesus, they overcome time and distance. Apart from all possible editing, alterations, changes in the Bible, because these things, these things, none of them change the moral teachings. And that's the only thing that we as spiritists are interested in. We are not interested if he's died on a Friday or on a Thursday. We are not interested if before saying something, he went up the mountain or down the mountain. We don't care for those things. Those are narratives. We don't use the narratives because they don't teach us anything. The teachings are in the actions and spoken words, not in the narrative. When the gospel says, Jesus went from this city to that city, that's not something that came out of Jesus' mouth. So, yeah, it's nice to know. Maybe it's all very interesting. So he was here and there. But this is only narrative. His words overcome time and distance. His words set the moral reference for a new philosophy that was about to come called spiritism. In which... We live by the absolutely truth in the reference, which are his teachings. His words set the moral reference for spiritism. What we have here is exactly that. And there's one little thing then. Some people at the time he was here with us and still today, some people value his words less than others. Some people criticize his words still today. Oh, this is not good. This is wrong. It shouldn't be that way. And other people don't do this. In Spiritism, in the Spirit's book, we can see why is that. Summarizing, Alan Kardec tells us through the Concourse of the Spirits that the less advanced spirits understand less of this and criticize more of it than the more advanced spirits more advanced spirits value the words of jesus a lot more than less advanced spirits so yeah there was a time that we didn't value any of that there was a time that we put them on the cross today is different several lifetimes over have passed and now I'm, hold on, let me, let me, you know, rethink the process. Let me go through all of this again. And then we come across spiritism at the best case scenario. You and I are on our second spiritist incarnation, if you will. So we are still very contaminated by a past of editing and, and fathers of the church and inquisition and crusades. But we are changing. We are understanding that the words of Jesus are here. Jesus never said it's not here. It's not in any translation of any Bible in any language. He never said, go to Jerusalem and kill all the Islamic population. That was the first crusade. He never said that. Take all the people who don't have the same belief system as you and set them on fire. Inquisition. It's not here. It's not in any Bible, in any translation to any language. So there are people who still value this in the form of a past. We don't anymore. Why? Because it has to do with the level of advancement, intellectual and moral advancement of each one of us. The words of Jesus have to be granted 
the true value, the weight that they carry. Our hearts have to carry the same weight. If we're not carrying the same weight in our hearts, we're still going through internal conflict. And of course, there's going to be suffering. So think about that. Guys, thank you very, very much. Uh, we will be here to answer some possible questions. And uh, you guys stay well. Thank you, Louise. Very inspiring. It made me think about how important it is that all of us read the words of teach of Jesus for ourselves rather than just relying on the interpretation of others. Right. Okay. Uh, let's see what questions we have. From the U.S. Spiritist Federation, is it a distraction to our spiritual progress if we debate excessively or doubt what Jesus really said versus what has been handed to us? Yeah, I think uh, it could be a distraction if it's excessively. Anything in excess is not good. Hmm. But I think we need to understand our side, black and white, solid ground. But we also need to understand where, for example, Catholics come from, their belief system, uh, Protestants and Islamic people, because one day these people might not follow what they follow today anymore. They will show up at the door of the spiritual center and say, I need help. I used to be whatever, Catholic or Islamic. If we understand them, where they're coming from, we're going to be able to serve them with a lot more, uh, with a better outcome than if we don't know anything about them. If we understand their, you know, what uh, hell and heaven, all of this, it is for them. It's a lot easier and a lot more productive for us to be able to help. So, yes, mm -hmm. we need to know, but not, not debate excessively. Leave out of that. Okay. Very good points. Let's see. Next question. From the International Spiritist Council. Does spiritism tend to favor one gospel over another? If true, how come? Okay, if you take the, the book, uh, Gospel According to Spiritist, for mm -hmm. each teaching that uh, uh, Alain Kardec is going to bring up to analyze and, and give us explanation on it, he will mention that similar text in the other gospels. So he'll say, this is in Matthew chapter such, it's also in Luke's chapter such, and it's also in John chapter such, because there's no favoritism here at all. Um, uh, if we go back in time, out of the four Gospels that came to be, three of them are considered synoptic Gospels, meaning they have more or less the same stories in different orders, uh, but for the most part, they are the same. Mm -hmm. And the only gospel that's a little bit different is John's gospels because he's focused much more on the spiritual life than in the narratives and the physical life of Jesus. So it, it's a different thing, but it doesn't, one doesn't go against the other. We use all of them, but we use, we do not, again, people, we do not use the narratives. We use the teachings. So if one gospel says he went from left to right and the other gospel said he went from right to left, we don't care. It's not important. So yes, there's uh, there's four gospels, four in the Bible. There's a lot more gospels than four. One one gospel that uh, was left out on on the uh, choice of the New Testament, and that happened in the year uh, 276, was the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is a collection of 114 sayings of Jesus. There is no narrative. The 114 lines all start the same way. Jesus said, quote, and then what he said. Number two, Jesus said, quote, and then what he said. That's the Gospel of Thomas. It's not even part of the New Testament, but it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. That's the word of mouth, if you will. That's Jesus speaking to us. And it's not even part of the Bible for different reasons. It's not the point today. You know, but even that, we don't favor any of the Gospels. We even use the Gospel of Thomas. That's not even on the Bible. There's also wonderful how much, as you just said, the Gospels complement each other. Correct. Okay. This is next question is from uh, Yasko Arakawa. Very interesting, the map with regions where each of the four Gospels were propagated. 
I would expect the Gospel of Luke reaching more at west, up to Italy, as he was with Paul and inherited his notes. So what do you think of that? Yeah, the, the, the map that I showed you is for, it's an, of course, it's an estimate uh, from the year 200 after uh, AD, 200 AD. And that, uh, what, what is the criteria to getting that map done? The criteria is historical documents. Nothing spiritual, nothing religious, historical documents. So at one point, let's say, for example, that we have uh, some historian in the past, let's say in the year 300, he wrote something in the year 300 and said, oh, about 100 years ago, this gospel here was totally dominant. So we get that information and we place it on the map. That's the criteria for the map. So yes, you see, when you read a book like Paul and Stephen, certain things are, are difficult to reconcile. But again, again, the information that we have is different than the information that the historians have. So the criteria is not the same. When Paul tells uh, the crew, right? I had the writings from, I had the full writings that I was given by Ananias. That's in the year 35. Historians believe that the first gospel was written in the year 72. Are they wrong? Are we right? No, no, no. Don't think of wrong and right. We use different references. That's all it is. They go by historical documents. We were not able to trace to day one. We don't have all the original documents. So we go as far back as we can, which is the year 210. And for us, we have other, other sources. So it's not a matter of right and wrong. It's different criteria. That's all. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Next question. From the United States Spiritist Federation. What would you think was the role of mediumship in the writing of the Gospels? Yeah, we didn't get into that. We, we spoke about the propagation of the Gospels. So the first original, the first guy who got oh, whatever type of pen on whatever type of uh, lambskin or, or papyrus, we don't have that. The oldest document that we have is from is a fragment, uh, size of a credit card, from the year two ten. So his, historically speaking, we cannot go back to that. But yes, we, we as uh, it would be nice so we can compare to what we have today. Then we would put, put our hands, physically speaking, on the very originals. We don't have that. But yeah, inspirations through mediumship, it's possible. Of course, it is. Uh, John's gospel is very spiritual. It doesn't, he doesn't have a lot of narratives. So it seems like it, it is something more connected through or to spirituality than the others. The others are using narratives. So it's less possible that the others use that much mediumship if they do. But possible, yes, it is possible. Okay. Next question. from the International Spiritist Council. Louise, can you elaborate on why the gospel according to spiritism cautions us not to take some of the words of Jesus too literally? Okay. Spiritism starts with the Spirit's book, of course. So Alan Kardec starts getting all these answers to his questions. He was the one making the questions to the spirits. And at one point he understands what the thing is all about. It's all about morality and so, so he goes back to the spirits and says, who, is, who can be my God? Who is the one that I should follow? And the answer is a straightforward answer, Jesus. If you are Alan Kardec in 1855 or six, when he's preparing his material, what would you do? I need to know everything about this guy. Absolutely everything, what he did and why, what he didn't do and why, what he proposed, what he didn't propose, what he, I need to know everything. There's only one spot for me to know this time which is the Bible. Alain Kardec had to go back to the Bible, study the Bible deeply, and, uh, the New Testament, and try to understand who Jesus was, because that was the answer from the spirits, question 625. So as he's studying this, you see, Alain Kardec is this very extremely 100% analytical guy. He wants black and white answers for everything. So when things were a little hazy and fuzzy in the New Testament, 
he would go back to the spirits in his mediumistic uh, uh, meetings and ask, this is written in the New Testament. Can you clarify this? The spirits would answer to him. Those ans answers were published in the book, in the book, the gospel according to spiritism at the end of each chapter. This it's called instructions from the spirits. That's the answers to the questions he had in those instructions. That's where you get the general feeling. You're not going to see a phrase that says, don't take it literally. But in those answers, you're going to see that, uh, uh, that vision, you know, take this route here, not that route. Don't take it literally as a concept, not as a phrase in the book. Don't take it literally. Take it more like, a, 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 you know, it, it, he's a counselor. Jesus came as this great counselor and mm -hmm. spiritism came to explain what he's, you know, uh, 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 saying why he was telling us what he did. Okay, thank you. Last question. When approaching the words of Jesus, is it fair to see spiritism as taking a back to basics approach? Okay, this is what we need to, we don't get into that because it wasn't the, the thing, but to answer the question, I'm gonna get into that. Mm -hmm. If you put a timeline in your, mind here we put a timeline we start from jesus when it gets to when we get to the problem with the christology that we discussed around the year 110 114 the problem starts to be bigger than expected so you start having these fragments of uh Christ christianity ebionites and all of those that i mentioned docetists so it, it gets fragmented when it gets to the year 11 uh 1054 a huge Sism, a huge break in the church takes place. So now as of that year, 1054, we have the Western Church, which becomes the Roman Catholic Church, and the Eastern Church on the Empire, which is the Orthodox Church. And from, from those points, the Catholic line has a bunch of branches that come out of it throughout time. Same for the Orthodox. So that today we have 41,000 denominations of Christianity because it's all fragmented across time. When spiritism came about, when Allan Kardec was preparing his material, he has to ask the spirits, you know, I have a Bible, but which Bible, which translation, you know, where does it come from the Latin? Does it come from the Greek? All of those things. And then that's what we understand. We are not fragments of any of these things. We go to the word of mouth of Jesus. We go to the words of Jesus, not to the words in the Bible, translation number such, not to the New Testament published in the year such by King James. No, because those carry, they are biased towards whatever the scribes and even King James himself change the Bible because he wanted the beliefs to be different. That that's it, where the Anglican uh, church is born from. We don't do any of this. We go to what Jesus said. This is what he said. There's no more back to basics than to put your ear on his mouth and hear what he's saying. So yes, spirit does go back to the basics altogether. 100%. Hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> the Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy is very interested in this subject as well. Has a lot of interesting things to say about that. Okay, so thank you everyone uh, who watched this live and we thank you all who have been following uh, our weekly talks. And once again, thank you for supporting the U.S. Spiritist Federation with a donation at our website or by scanning the QR code. The U.S. Spiritist Federation in Disseminating Spiritism for Everyone does invest funds in producing uh, new materials, and so this does require support, so all help is appreciated. Please note, there will not be a talk next Saturday, June 4th, due to the United States Spiritist Federation's General Assembly meeting. Our next talk will be on Saturday, June 11th at 11 a.m. 
we will have Daniel Assisi. The theme will be announced soon. And now, before we end our live, Louise, can you do a prayer for us? A final prayer? Absolutely. All right. Thank you, everyone, and have a great weekend. Okay, so let's, um, let's concentrate ourselves in the image of the master. Let's ask him for his presence in our hearts right now, in our minds. Thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity to be here discussing your message, trying to understand better, trying to bring it into our hearts as deep as we can. We ask Jesus that you can convey your message to the suffering spirits, that they can find their way through God's mercy to understand as his moral spirits what your teachings were all about. May your words get into their hearts and their minds. They can continue their lives through spiritual education. For those in prisons and hospitals, same thing. They can receive your teachings and redo her lives. Think of all the great things that we can do once we are liberated from the polluted messages of the past. Thank you, Jesus, once again. Stay with us, always in our minds and our hearts. So be it. So be it.